Manufacturers are constantly coming out with new products to outdo each other and Pecron is no exception. They are expanding the boundaries at this price point with some unique new capabilities. Pecron sent me their newly released E1500 LFP to evaluate and it's better in almost every way than the E2000 I reviewed just a few months ago. Welcome back to Projects with Everyday Dave. Let's test this thing out and see what it's made of. With the E1500, Pecron has made a huge upgrade at this price point by integrating the AC to DC charger and eliminating the need for this noisy external charger. At the same time, this provides a much more ideal setup for the addition of the new UPS feature. Now you can plug it into the wall using this port on the front and plug all of your other appliances into the available outlets. The unit will stay charged and if the power goes out, it will switch to battery backup in milliseconds. Your devices won't even know what happened. The internal charger is also a lot more powerful. It charges at a rate of 1400 watts. I was able to charge the main unit plus an additional battery in just over five hours. That's faster than the E2000 can charge with two external chargers connected. If you have additional external batteries, you can charge even faster by adding solar or using the external charger and the additional input port on each one of the batteries. Each battery can take an additional 400 watts and that's a lot of flexibility for charging. To confirm the DC usage capacity, I applied an eight amp, 106 watt load on the 30 amp DC power port. It ran for 13 hours and nine minutes with a total of 1,406 watt hours out of the rated 1,536 watt hours, which is an impressive 92% of its rated capacity. That's one of the best I've seen on these all-in-one power stations. I ran the same test on the external battery since it also has a 30 amp 13.3 volt port. It ran for 25 hours and 57 minutes with a total of 2,769 watt hours out of the rated 3,072 watt hours, which is 90% of its rated capacity. Combining the main unit and two external batteries, you could run a 100 watt load for more than 65 hours with no problem. AC capacity can vary quite a bit depending on whether it's a constant load or an intermittent load. For a best case AC capacity, I use the heating element in my water heater. It provides a constant 1,475 watt load. For this test, I included one extra battery. The result was a consumption of 4,407 watt hours out of the rated combined capacity of 4,608 watt hours. And that is a whopping 96% of the rated capacity. Typically, the DC performance does better than the AC performance, and that's not the case here. So I imagine the AC inverter in this unit is very efficient. The next type of AC load to check is an intermittent load. And I like to use my full-size fridge as an example for that. I ran the test including one external battery starting at 100% state of charge. The fridge ran for one day and eight hours, and that's plenty of time to get all the way through the night and if you have a cloudy day the next day to get through the next day without a whole lot of solar input. The fridge consumed 2,934 watt hours out of the rated combined capacity of 4,608 watt hours, which is 64% of the rated capacity. And this is because the inverter consumes power on idle even when the fridge is not consuming any power. And that's why I do real world testing instead of just adding up specs in a spreadsheet. Someone in the comments on another video the other day had a bright idea of turning the inverter on for two hours and then back off for two hours to try and save the idle consumption and let it run longer. And while that would work to reduce the battery consumption by the idling of the inverter, if you were trying to do that during the night, you certainly wouldn't get much sleep. At 2200 watts, this power station can handle most household appliances, such as a hot pot, a hot plate, the Keurig, a toaster or bread maker. And when it comes to tools, there are some limitations. It can charge batteries, it can run a pancake compressor, but it won't run most large induction motor devices. For larger power tools that have one and a half horsepower motors, like a full-size table saw or dust collector, a very large air compressor, it just doesn't have quite enough to get it over the hump of getting started. Now, sometimes I can get it to work with an active start. Here's the difference between the two. Here's without the active start. It overloaded almost immediately. And then with the active start. Now, this company that makes these active start devices has been working with me to tune these and try and get them to work better. We're almost there, but not quite yet. You can tune them in the settings and get really close, but here's the result with the active start. So you can see it 
almost gets there. And this has some special software and hardware in it that starts the motor a lot more softly. I'm using a version of this to get these kind of inverters to work with my heat pump. Um, but there's some tuning yet to do. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, nonetheless, most power tools, hand tools, chop saw, things like that will be fine. But uh, the larger one and a half horsepower tools, uh, this unit doesn't have quite enough to get them over that start. All right, I'm gonna run a full load test here. We'll see what this can put out and I'll see if it can maintain the 120 volt target while it's doing that. All right, let's see. Turn a light on there with about 200 watts and then I can make sure our voltage is running properly. 119.9, right on. Okay, all right, let's turn some stuff on. The heater. All right, there we are at 1,000 watts. 120 volts right on, 1,500 watts, 2,178, 119.6, perfect. Got some other random loads I can plug in here. The light I should push it over almost right at, oh, there we go, 2,277. Hey, it's holding over target there. Let's see how long it can do that. 60 hertz, 120 volts, 2,270 watts. It's only rated for 2,200 and we're holding over that continuously with no problem staying at 120 it's even slightly over 120 volts the meter says 119.5 well i say that's pretty good i mean we're holding over the rated capacity continually and it's holding the voltage and the frequency no problem just plug some more things in here and see if i can get this thing to trip Ooh. 2300 watts 2400 watts Wow, that is really good. 2,400 watts and it's just chugging along. 119.5. I'm, I'm actually really impressed. I've run out of things to plug in. <laughs> Got a heat gun plugged in there. Battery chargers, lights, heaters, heat gun. I mean, we're at two and a half minutes at well over the rated capacity and it's still going. Typically these devices shut off very shortly after they're rated max. Oh, there it went. All right, three and a half minutes at about 2,400 watts before it finally decided to stop. I I'd say that's pretty impressive. I'm very happy with that result. I picked up this 50 amp plasma cutter from Vivor as another tool to test these larger inverters. Vivor makes the cabinets that I use for my DC combiner boxes. This thing is only $220, and I don't know how they make them so cheap. Plus, they gave me a code you can use to get an additional 5% off anything on their site. You can find that in the description below. Now, I don't really expect this to work because the minimum setting on this is 20 amps, which would be 2400 watts, and this is only capable of a surge capacity at 2400 watts. But hey, you never know until you try. The plasma cutter comes with an adapter, so you can run it on 240 or 120. So I'll put that 120 plug on here. I have it set to the lowest setting and the compressor is already charged up, so I don't need to add that load to it. I'll see if I can cut this piece of steel here. All right, first let's see if I can at least strike a, strike a flame. All right, let's see. Yee! 2,000 watts. 2100 watts. <laughs> oh, it died so close. So if I can't even keep the torch on, I'm probably not gonna be able to cut it, but I'll restart it and we'll try one more time here. All right, I managed to cut, you know, about five or six millimeters in, but man, it's so close. I mean, what that tells you is, you know, a 2000 watt inverter is gonna power most things in your house that you need to run. But if you wanna get into some power tools like a table saw or some larger equipment welder or plasma cutter, you need a little bit more than 2000 watts. But I mean, it's really close. But that's a fun test. Can't wait to use it on some future projects and try it out on some higher power inverters. That's gonna be fun. The sun's just peeking over the horizon. It's gonna be a beautiful sunny day. 
Both batteries are completely depleted from my last test. So now I want to do a max solar charging test. I'm going to disconnect two of my panels from my main solar array and connect them in series, which will put us in a really good spot for both current and voltage to see what the maximum solar input for this unit can be and what the practical uh, charging time would be if I was going to do it by solar. These panels are rated at 39.8 maximum voltage so when i put two together that's less than 40 volts per panel 80 volts combined is less than the 95 volt max for the unit so this will be really really good test for us just go ahead and connect these two panels in series and then i'm going to check the voltage just to make sure all right and there we have 91.9 volts so this is a good example of why you want to actually check it. They're actually currently putting out more than their max rated voltage, and that's because it's very cold. It's almost freezing out right now. Actually, there's a little frost on the ground. It probably is freezing. And when panels are cold, their voltage goes up. But 91 volts, 92 volts, still under our 95 volt max, so this will work just fine. I made a little extension here so I can extend this down. I'll use, this is the plus, I'll use the red wire for that just so it makes it easy. Make sure I didn't mess something up. There we go. Wow, it's even creeping up a little bit as the sun starts to hit it. We're at we're at 92.2 volts. Now, when I connect it, you know, the load will drop that voltage. So we just want to make sure it's under 95 when I connect it up. I could carry this around, but this is a lot easier. I'm going to keep this up under here. So it's mostly in the shade all day. There we go. Plug it into the 95 volt max 700 watt port and before I connect the power I'll double check the voltage 92.9 volts so we're okay to plug that in now we're not going to get a lot of power right now the sun is just coming over the horizon two end panels connected in series through a little extension cable and over to the unit the sun just coming over the horizon there lighten these two end panels up let's see what it does now these panels are 375 watts each, so two of them together is 750 watts. Now that is more than the rated input for this system, which is 700 watts, but as long as we're under the max voltage, that's okay. It just won't make use of the extra 50 watts that could be available. And the reality is, except under perfect conditions, these panels won't put out that much anyway. So we'll be perfectly fine as long as we're under the voltage. All right, I'm about halfway through the day and 47%, almost halfway charged. We're putting in 665 watts. They're coming really close to the 700 watt max. Now, there is another trick that I can employ here to speed things up. The battery has its own maximum power point tracker that's independent from the main unit. So I've set up the Pecron folding panel out there and I can connect that directly to the battery and will give the whole system a little bit of a boost. That will allow us to add 400 watts to the 700 and get all the way up to 1100 if we wanted to. But I'm only gonna add 200 watts at the moment just to show that I can put more power in than the 700 watt maximum that the inverter itself can take. So I'm going to use the clamp meter to measure the current that we have going in now, which is 10.2 amps. And then I'll see if that changes at all when I plug in the battery. That stays the same, still 664 on the meter, but over here I can measure 4.2 amps. Now that the PowerPoint tracker's caught up to it, another 4.2 amps into the battery directly, and I'm still maintaining 665 watts through the main unit. That extra four amps I'm putting into the battery down below, probably 130 watts or so, that will speed this up dramatically. Now I'm not gonna leave it plugged in because I wanna see if I can charge both batteries with just the main charger. This is just so you understand that you can actually do it even faster than this. Dust these panels off a little bit, see if it makes any measurable difference. Dusting the panels off made a tiny bit of difference. It went from 664 to about 668. So just a few watts, probably not worth the trouble. All right, there we are, 50%. I think we have a pretty good prospect of having this thing fully charged in one day. If we continue at this rate, it says it would take 3.4 hours to finish. We probably can't maintain that 667 watts for the next three and a half hours, but I think for sure we'll finish before the sun goes down. The interesting thing is my solar edge inverter, which I robbed these two panels from, it's already maxed out at 7.6 kilowatts, so it doesn't even know these panels are missing. It's making absolutely zero impact to the household production right now. Another interesting tidbit here, we're at 670 watts, 9.7 amps, 
and the maximum power point for these panels is 9.4 amps. So the unit is actually pulling a little more current than the maximum, and that maximum power point being a little bit higher is probably because we're over 1,000 watts per meter squared right now on the solar irradiance. Well, we're at 96%, and it's down to 60, 70 watts because there's a little bit of cloud cover swinging in, so I don't think we're going to quite make 100%. If I had added this other panel and boosted the battery by itself, we would have totally made it no problem. Or if I had articulated the panels towards the sun throughout the day, that probably also would have been enough. Another option would have been to put two additional panels in parallel with these two. That would have gotten us you know, closer to the 700 watts throughout more of the day. Either way, really close. I'll wait till the sun goes down and see what it finally ends up at. The final result for the day was 97% of the 4.6 kilowatt hour capacity for a sunny day in the fall with fixed panels. If it was the middle of the summer, it would have finished. And ideally, you're not using 100% of the battery each day, so you wouldn't need to charge up from zero like I did. Either way, this is where the additional charge port on the extended battery really comes in handy. For illustration, I connected two of the Pecron 200 watt folding panels in series to the main unit to show how much power you can expect to get from them on a typical sunny day. At 1000 watts per meter squared, we're getting 278 watts on the input. The Pecron 200 watt folding solar panel is a nice lightweight form factor. However, folding panels usually underperform relative to premium rigid panels. In my testing, at 1000 watts per meter squared, a single panel produces 150 watts, which is 75% of its rated output. Temperature and slight misalignment of the individual panes are likely the biggest factors in this difference. With this panel, the max output you can expect to achieve on a perfect day at 1200 watts per meter squared is 180 watts. Or if you combine two panels in series, the max you could expect to see is about 360 watts. For those reasons, I always recommend getting some fixed panels unless you have to have a folding panel for portability. In that case, if you're going to go camping, you need to fit it in your trunk or be able to pack it somewhere. You just can't beat the portability of the folding panels. All right, one of my favorite upgrades to this version is the 30 amp 12 volt DC port, which actually puts out a regulated 13.3 volts. There's one on the inverter and there's one on each expansion battery. It uses a standard XT60 plug, making it really easy to make your own cables for connecting other devices like what I've done here. With a 30 amp capacity, you can actually turn each expansion battery into its own mini power station. Originally, I built this power station using a 1000 watt Renogy inverter, but I was getting voltage fluctuations under full load. Pecron told me it was an issue with the inverter. So I asked Ampeak to send me their 1200 watt pure sine wave inverter. It's cheaper, more powerful, and in this particular case, it actually works better. I'll leave a link in the description with any discount code I can provide as well. Now, a 1200 watt inverter is overkill for this situation since I can only pull about 300 watts from this 30 amp port, but it's good to have a 12 volt inverter on hand to be used with any 12 volt setup. You can connect it to your car battery or any other 12 volt battery if you need power in an emergency situation. It comes with cables and cable covers, but I left these exposed so that you can see how I put this unit together. I used a 30 amp breaker and 10 gauge wire since this system only pulls 30 amp. I included my Victron shunt in here so that I can monitor the power independently, but you wouldn't need that since the inverter has its own display anyway. All right, I have a whole host of devices to plug in, so let's give it a go and see how well it works. All right, we're at 13.3 volts, 13.2 on the readout here. Let's start plugging stuff in. I have an extension cord here just to make this easier. All right, let's start plugging stuff in here. 75 watts. Lights in here, 92 watts. Okay, and that's actually 105. This says 93, but Victron says 105, and that's why I have that on there. I want to see what I'm actually pulling. More light, 128 watts. And battery charger. Ooh, there we go. 225 watts. See, I got another battery charger. Fan starting to come on, so it's pulling something. 276 watts. This says 243. Oh, too much. I, 
I got more than that before, so maybe the surge in load was the problem. We'll try again here. All right, 82 watts. I'm going to plug this heating iron in first. Ooh, 390. That's why that heating iron is really pulling a lot of power, especially when it first comes on. 275 watts. Now I'll plug in the other charger. Ooh, 316. 316 watts, 24 amps. This is holding steady at 12.9 volts, so it's above the 12 volt threshold, which is really good at 24, 24 amps, and it's still almost 13 volts. I mean, that's holding up pretty well. Now you can see it doesn't do very well with surge loads. Well, of course, that was way over the rated capacity, so maybe that's expected. But let's see if we can push it just a little bit more. Plug in one of these lights. 328 watts, 25 amps, still more than 12 volts. And this is saying 292 watts, but I know from the Victron shunt it's actually pulling more than that. One more light. Come on. Ooh, yeah. 350 watts, 27 amps. That's pretty good. I mean, it doesn't have a whole lot of surge protection, you know, if you have a short high impact load that cuts off pretty fast but you know if you're bringing it up gradually i mean i'm hitting 350 watts 27 amps on a steady load lights and chargers and heaters and all kinds of stuff here so i mean you can see how capable this 30 amp port is this adds so much flexibility to these extension batteries it also has a 100 watt uh, usb-c port and it has a 18 watt USB-A port. This cable's getting slightly warm. It would be nice if this was an XT90 instead of an XT60 connector so I could connect a little bit heavier gauge wire on there, but uh, I can't really complain. It's a really nice feature. So there's one of those ports on the main unit and on each battery. Lots of new flexibility with that. I really like this feature. and I think we're gonna see it on some other brands as well because it's something people are gonna want. All right, the instructions say to have these two units as close to the same percent charge as possible before you connect them together. But that might not always be convenient. So I've depleted this one down to zero and the battery is up at 100%. And I'm just kind of curious to see what happens in case you accidentally do that sometime. So here you can see we're at zero percent. Let's plug it in. Now, after a few seconds, it should identify the battery's capacity and adjust, maybe. Well, the video doesn't show it very well, but the LEDs are showing that the battery's connected and it is discharging into the unit. So I can see that it's moving power from the battery to the main unit, and apparently it's gonna have to shift some energy over to the main battery before it will even turn on. So I'll give it a minute and time how long it takes to balance out sufficiently to actually turn on. All right, I gave it about 45 minutes. Let's see what we get. Hey, now it's showing 1% charged and it's allowing me to power up the DC and the AC output. All right, let me put a load on this and see how it works. Well, there we go, 1,000 watts and it seems to be working just fine. <laughs> the percentage is dropping though. So it dropped from 2% to 1%. It must need to have more time to fully balance the capacity between the two batteries. Because, I mean, I know the, the battery, because it's still saying 1%, and I know the battery's at 100%, and normally when they're closer in capacity, the percentage updates. So probably it isn't ready to fully function as a combined unit. The, difference in battery voltages are probably too far apart. So I'm kind of curious to see how long it takes for them to balance and for it to operate as one unit again. I'll give it some more time and, and let it balance out. All right, it's been about three hours. It's showing 67% now. So I think it's reached a balance that it can identify both power sources and lump them together and operate under its full normal operation. Let's just run some AC here just to confirm. There we go. 
pulling 1200 watts, nice and steady, no problem. Now I'm just gonna disconnect the battery and see how much it actually transferred over. It takes it a minute to, uh, there it goes, down to 24%. So it charged up this battery to about 24%, taking away from the 100% charged uh, extra battery. That was enough to balance it out and start operating normally. So just something to understand, you know, if you have a fully charged battery and a completely charged inverter, it's gonna take a little bit of time for them to equalize before you can use it under normal conditions. There it is, back to 67%, ready to go. All right, price. Even though warranty is a bit behind the industry at two years, I don't think you will be able to beat these features for this price anywhere else. This video happens to coincide with Black Friday sale. You can get either the E1500 LFP or the E2000 LFP for $899. Plus, if you use the link and the discount code you'll find in the description, you can get an additional 5% off of that already really low price. If you were considering getting one of these power stations, now is probably the time to do it. If you want more detail on the E2000, I'll leave a link at the end of this video and in the description to that detailed review. I did a lot more power tool testing in that video, and the E1500 is slightly more powerful, so all those results will be applicable for both units. Now, which one of these units is right for you? Well, I made a comparison chart to go over some of the key feature differences to make that decision easier for you. To start with, the E1500 is on back order, so if you need it right away, you're stuck with the E2000. The top advantages for the E1500 are 200 watts more AC power. That probably won't change what devices you can power, but it will change how many you can power at one time. The built-in charger is much more powerful and that eliminates the need for the bulky charger. That also enables the UPS feature and that's a make or break feature for some people running a CPAP or other critical hardware. The new 30 amp DC port may be a critical feature if you have an RV and need to power a lot of DC loads. The 100 watt USB-C on this unit is actually capable of 125 watts. And if that's something that you need, that's something to consider. The E2000 and both expansion batteries max out at somewhere between 90 and 94 watts. The fridge test shows lower performance on the 1500, but I think that may have been an issue with my test. I did turn off the fridge for a little while and I might have left the AC inverter on during that time period, draining the battery while it wasn't being used. Unfortunately, I don't have time to rerun the test and confirm that. And I expect the performance is likely closer to the 86% performance that I found on the E2000. Now, why would you want the E2000? First, they're the same price right now, but the E2000 has about 400 watt hours more battery capacity. Second, it has two high power solar inputs. That allows you to have almost double the solar input and the ability to have panels facing two different directions at the same time. So if battery capacity and solar input are the most important features for you, then the E2000 is the one for you. No review is complete without some areas for improvement. First, there's a gap in the input voltage range for the two solar MPPT inputs. Some common brands, such as my Blue Eddy 200 watt folding panel or my Bouge RV CIGS 200 watt flexible panel, don't work because their voltage is around 24 volts, too high for the low voltage input and too low for the high voltage threshold to start the MPPT. If you have two panels, that's no problem. You can just connect them in series. But if you have one panel, it's something to be aware of. Also, the MPPT is slower than some of the competitors. If you have a situation where the panels are constantly shifting from shade to full sun, the MPPT is a little bit slow to catch up to the new PowerPoint. The steps in the manual for getting into the settings are incorrect. On the screen is my recommendation for the changes to the manual, and you can screen grab that if you like. I sent those to Pecron, so hopefully future manuals will be corrected just in case this is how you do it. Press and hold the DC button until it comes on. Press and hold AC-DC till the battery flashes. Immediately press and hold the DC button till it switches to setup mode. Then you can cycle between 50 and 60 hertz. Press the AC to go to the next menu. You can change the voltage between 100, 110, and 120, which is actually really nice. And this unit actually holds 120 volts all the way up to its maximum power output, which is something um, generally lower priced units can't do. So that's pretty good. Anyway, you can cycle through all the menus and just keep hitting the AC button until you're done. It will save them and exit out. 
The inverter and expansion batteries are slightly different sizes, so they don't stack up terribly well. I suspect that's because they were trying to make the expansion battery as small as possible, which I have to say, they've done a great job of that. Also, the main unit has these really nice grab handles for moving it around, but the much heavier expansion batteries have just a lip with no undercut, and you have to have some pretty strong fingers to hold on to it that way. I had trouble getting the app to connect. I tried several times and gave up, and then the next day it connected just fine. So it could be my Wi-Fi. You don't actually need the app, but it is a nice interface to manage the controls and see what the status of the unit is. I would like to be able to control the battery charge and discharge range to improve the battery life, especially if I'm using it in UPS mode. I wouldn't want it to be at 100% charge all the time. I would like to be able to set it to 80 or 90% to extend the battery life a little bit more. Although it has a lithium iron phosphate battery, so that's probably not a huge deal. Finally, it has proprietary connectors, but they provide all the adapters that you are likely to need. Anderson connectors and regular power connectors and cigarette lighter adapter and an XT60 to cigarette lighter and XT60 to clamps and their proprietary adapter to MC4. So you should have everything that you need. And if you don't, you should be able to adapt from one of these to what you need. It's hard to find many improvement areas for this power station. I suspect if you get one, you won't be disappointed with it. Check out the detailed review of the E2000 LFP, or if you wanna build your own, check out this video. I have some very interesting new projects coming, so be sure and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.